Vision. That's Allison. Thank you. Kids can make their way to Children's Church if you'd like, and you guys, if you want to head down there. The rest of us are in Joshua chapter 1. Sue, what are you doing down there today? Are you a teaching? All right. Thank you. Good job. No, I didn't mean like if she was just attending, like if she had a different role. That's what I mostly meant. And she's like, no, I pick children's church all the time. All right, how many of you have your Bible with you? This is old uh, VBS days. Okay, let's see your Bible. Hold up your Bibli. Okay, I see a few phones. Okay. I, all right, I'll just trust that's within that blue bag of yours. I'm not even sure what's in there. It's a cookbook, isn't it? You're keeping up with lessons. No, she definitely, Joyce, has her Bible. You're going to need to bring your Bible, and uh, I'm all for it on your phone, uh, but maybe uh, up ahead you might want to think about bringing your actual uh, Bible because we're going to be working our way through Joshua. And like today especially, as we look at that first section, you kind of want to see it. You're going to want to look at the movement of this first chapter because it kind of lays the groundwork for the whole thing. You may have heard the phrase, it's not enough to leave Egypt, you need to enter the promised land. You've heard that old phrase? Okay. And if you haven't, I don't know where you were, I just said it. So... The idea is that they, God's people left Egypt, then you had 40 years of this wandering before finally, in Joshua 1, they're entering into the promised land. And it became symbolic for us that it's not enough just to leave Egypt, leave the bondage. We need to enter into the blessings. And think for a minute, this is not that uncommon. The one who comes to know Jesus and all of these old habits, they're broken. We're already successful. Then the rest of life ends up struggling with all of those sins that we have conquered. It's still looking backwards at all of these habits and hang-ups that we have, patterns of sin, And life becomes spending time in the Word so that we can just conquer this and live a wholesome life. Now, turn your back on Egypt. That's successful. And conquer the promised land. Go in for the blessings. God has taken us out of Egypt, not just so that we're without sin. He's gotten us out of Egypt, out of sin, so that we can live in the blessings of what he has called us to. And Joshua is there. He's right at the verge of this in Joshua chapter 1, where they're finally entering into the promised land. If life is a struggle and your vantage point is backwards, If success in life is just, I didn't sin as much as I did yesterday. Or if the great accomplishments in life are, if I could just get this sin under control. If I could just get rid of that in my life. It's backwards. We're looking backwards and living in defeat. We look ahead. Personally, and as a church, We look ahead and live victoriously, taking the blessings of what God has for us and the challenges, accepting the challenges and moving on and accomplishing great things for the Lord. That's all ahead of us, but we're stuck looking backwards, grappling with sin management and living in defeat. That is way too common of a scenario. Literally, we just ask the question, what is the goal? What's what's the goal of this Christian life? Well, I'm just, I want to live right, and I want to have a relationship with God so that my life is smoother, it's easier this way. Hmm. That's not the goal of the Christian life. That's a means to an end. Yes, I want to have less sin in my life too, and I want to constantly be confessing and repenting, but I'm not focusing on the sin. I'm focusing ahead 
as a church, we focus ahead. What's the goal of a church? For someone that doesn't know what it is supposed to be, and somebody that just comes in and just looks things over and spends six months watching, they would likely conclude in many, many churches, the goal seems to be to meet budget. That, that's high on the list. If they finish six months or a year and they've met budget, they go, well, that's a successful year. Maybe grow a little bit numerically. That, that's not the goal of the church. The goal of the church is to fulfill the mission, which is to go out into this world and reach the lost and see people come to know Christ and be discipled in their faith to reach others who reach others. And there'll be seasons in which we'll be in the red doing it. It's not the goal. It's a sign. You can have signs of health. Yeah, numeric, all levels of growth, organizational growth numerical growth, financial growth, those are, those are barometers, those are actually important. But it's not the goal. So we ask the question for ourselves, what's our goal in the Christian life? What's the goal? And we see here in Joshua where finally they're putting Egypt to rest, the wandering to rest, and we're walking into the success of courage and strength. So we're going to look at two points today. Isn't that great news? Only two points, not three. <laughs> Doesn't that mean it's a third less time? Don't, wouldn't you think it would? It's not, but you'd think it should have been. So two easy points, but let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here to speak and to share your word would ask that you would give wisdom and maybe challenge or encouragement. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Joshua chapter 1, first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at um, kind of the outline of the book. It's more interesting than you think. And then we're going to look at a key factor in moving forward. So two easy points. First one is the outline of the book. This is so easy, it's not even fair. If you open your Bible there to Joshua, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, this is chapter 1, verse 1, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them and the people of Israel. That's verse 2. Verse 3. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given it to you, just as I promised to Moses. Now, 4 and 5. From the wilderness, in this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. There's the framing of the entire book in uh, verses 2, 3, 4, and 5, and I'm going to have you write in your Bible. If you don't normally write in your Bible, it's okay. Write in the Bible next to you. You, so it's, it's fine. They don't mind. Just grab their Bible and write in it, and then they'll write in yours. Same thing, but you didn't violate your little principle. So here we are right at the verge. Uh, I was telling Janet and I were talking about one of my favorite photos ever is of Grant and Emma, and it was on Mount Nebo in, the, in Jordan, the country of Jordan, and on Mount Nebo, and it's the it's the back of them, and they were young. Grant was maybe uh, junior high, and so Emma, a couple years younger, and they're on Mount Nebo looking, and Emma's pointing, and Grant's trying to figure out what's going on, and he's kind of peering, and Grant, or Emma's pointing, and literally standing on Mount Nebo looking across, and you can see from there the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, Jerusalem, Jericho and the Dead Sea. It's the last thing Moses saw. God said, let me show you, but you're not going. 
because of some disobedience, he died right there, somewhere buried there. But we saw it. That's where we are. We're looking out over and saying, claim the blessings. The New Testament has 750 promises to the Christian. (laughs) We can't name them. Is Is that fantastic? He promised us so much. We don't even know what they are. Because we're looking out all of this, and we're too captivated by what's behind us. Yeah, but i got to get clean on this, and I'm struggling with this. No, it's already won. The battle's done. That's been conquered. Yes, continually confess and repent and move forward, but our focus is not on that. Our focus is ahead. And if you look again at your Bible now, look at the outline of the book. It's one of the few books that actually does this for us. The outline of the entire book is in these three verses. So the first one is verse 2. Verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and this people, into the land that I'm giving them to the people of Israel. This is chapters 1 through 5. It's the preparation of going. We're about to go. It's the preparation. My servant is dead. Now prepare yourself. We're going. Chapters 1 to 5. It's very, very easy. You're not going to have to think hard. There's 24 chapters in Joshua. Easy, 12 and 12. 1 to 12, 13 to 24. 1 to 12, preparation, 1 to 5, and the rest of that half is going and conquering. The last half, blessings. So 1 to 12, 13 to 24. So there it is. I marked it in my Bible. Verse 2 is chapters 1 to 5. It's the preparation. Be prepared to go. This begs a question. Why doesn't God use us more than we actually want Him to? It's a a fair question. Maybe He doesn't have anything in particular that's grand, whatever grand means, right? You have to define that. It doesn't have to be big. Why doesn't God use us more? Here's a hard question. Why doesn't he use abundant life more in the community? I mean, why aren't nonprofits dependent on us? Here's one answer. I'll admit it's a whole study. We could look at many things. One answer, we're not prepared to do it. Not fit enough. God isn't going to call somebody or a group of people to accomplish something if they're not prepared and fit to do it. The pressure of participation in a community and the weight of responsibility with budget and volunteers, there is a, it takes a maturity and a, strength, a spiritual strength to accomplish things for God, and I'm afraid he looks down, and I'm not necessarily saying here, we're just posing the hypothetical situation. I know he looks down at certain congregations, and he goes, well, I can't use them. They're not prepared. They're not, they'd never last. Most of them don't spend time in the Word, or most of them are still struggling with Egypt. They're not ready to move forward. They're not at the place in which we can use them. And as offensive as that is, I'm willing to accept that proposition as a possibility in my own life. Being an old guy, I was raised watching uh, Happy Days. And there's a great episode where Potsy, he's on the bench basketball. He never plays. So finally, the coach, for some reason, goes, Potsy, you're in. And he had the shocked look on his face, 
And he had to go over and tell the coach, he goes, I don't have shorts on underneath my warm-up because I didn't think you were ever going to put me in. Yeah, I think that's kind of it. I think it's the, I'm not ready to go. I'm not ready to accomplish that. I'm not trained enough. I'm not strong enough. My prayer life is not developed enough in order to accomplish that. Jesus, before every major event in his life, went away for extended period of time alone with his heavenly Father. Even he did because he couldn't face the challenge outside of that kind of communion with God. If that's true of him, how much prayer would it take us? And we go, yeah, prayer life's not, not stellar, maybe. It's okay. That is perfectly okay. It's recognizing chapters 1 to 5 are preparation. How do we prepare ourselves to go in and conquer the promised land? That's chapters 1 to 5. The very next verse. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. That's chapters 6 through 12. It's the last half of this half. It's battles and overcoming. It's interesting that there are battles. Go back to how we often think about life, Christian life. I'm spending time with Jesus, and I'm reading my devotionals, and, and if I were to be honest, I'm trying to live a battle-free life. When a trial comes, whether it's health or relational or financial, when a trial comes, my goal is get out of the trial. That's not the goal. Oh, I want to get out of it too, and I would love for you to be out of any challenge or trial that you're ever facing. And I'm actually going to pray to that end. But then we're going to pray, but keep them in that as long as you feel it's fit for them to be in it because there's a bigger picture at stake. It's not a surprise that we face struggles and trials. It's a surprise that we break into the get-me-out-of-it mode as our number one goal going through it. And some he'll never solve. For someone who can't walk and they pray, I wish they could walk, I wish they could walk, they'll never walk again. And they didn't. They never walked again. Never walked again. Well, it's a shame the goal was to walk. I don't know what God's will is. And the more we do for the Lord, the more trials that seem to come. Like that could be the way in which we could um, make things go smooth, keep your head down. Make sure Satan doesn't know that you're busy. Yes, let's step out. Let's share our faith every day. And let's, let's look for ways to combat the wrong in our community and promote Jesus Christ alone as salvation. Let's do all of those things and watch the trials come. It's chapter 6 to 12. It ends up the whole first half. 1 to 5 preparation, 6 to 12, literally is a series of trials. But then come the blessings. And you can, again, write this in your Bible. Verse 2 is preparation. It's chapters 1 to 5. Verse 3, battles. Chapters 6 to 12. And then four and five are blessings. From the wilderness in this Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. It's the blessings. It leads to the blessings. 
that's what we're working through. Three weeks on preparations, some weeks on battles, and then the final weeks we're going to spend on the uh, blessings. But this is actually the main point for the morning, is this next point. It's a final point. It's the source of success. Famous verses. Put them to memory if you don't know them. Start in verse 6. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to the fathers I'd give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Don't turn from it, the right to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. Okay, look at that. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do all that he said to do. It's obedience. And then I will make you and give you good success. Be strong and courageous. Get your head up. Just do what I have asked you to do and I will give you good success. It's like it's a formula, but there's a piece that he hasn't revealed yet. The formula, which is obedience. Oh, if I'm obedient to God, he'll give me the success, spiritual success. I'm not talking prosperity theology. And yet, though, when we follow the rules that God has created, we are more successful. If I'm just obedient, if I'm obedient then I'll have good success. True. But how can I be obedient? There's the honest question. I have trouble with obedience. I try, I try, I try and fail. Verse 8, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, and there's these great two words, so that you may be careful to do according to all that's written in it. Then, for uh, for then you will uh, make your way prosperous, and you will have good success. Do you see the so that? This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, meditate it on day and night, so that you will be careful to do according to all that's written in it, and then he'll make your way prosperous. Do you you see where I, too often, I'm missing the obvious? He's called us to obedience. He'll give prosperity and success and courage to those who are obedient. Great. I'm going to go work really hard on being obedient. No, wait a minute. Don't let the book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you can do all that's according written. It's meditation on the Word. It's stopping and slowing down, going to bed with the Scriptures going through our mind. Not the TV on, and then we're literally opening ourselves up for whatever we're going to listen to. Or whatever you're thinking about, whether it's a trial or a problem, and you're just rolling it over and over. Yet you're meditating on it. That's what we do or something you really want to happen, and we can call it fantasy, or you can call it anything we want, but we go to bed thinking about it and thinking about it and thinking about it. Yeah, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You think tension, you're, you live in tension. How do we live a prosperous and successful life? How are we courageous? Be careful to do according to the law that Moses, my servant, commanded. Don't turn from it right or left. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you will do accordingly. Dawson Trotman was born in Bisbee, Arizona. And Dawson Trotman's the founder of Navigators. He's the one that came alongside of uh, Billy Graham with discipleship. Uh, how many of you have been a part of Navigators? 
Weren't you a part of Navigators? Oh, you were Air Force. Navy guys. Yeah, Navigators or not? Okay, he was real big in, uh, in the Navy. He lived to be 50. He died in, uh, in New York, Scroon Lake. He drowned trying to save somebody at age 50. He was a riot. Apparently, he was a party when he walked in the room. This guy was hilarious. He was so focused. He was known for, and if you've heard it and seen it, he's known for, from small groups to large, he'd take his Bible and he'd say, this is it. You successful, prosperous, take hold and grasp the Bible. That's what he would do. So take a look at this next slide. And he labeled his fingers, and he would say, as you can see there, he says you need to hear the Word, read the Word, study the Word, memorize, and then he would pause, and he'd turn his Bible over and hold it and say, and meditate. The thumb was meditate because that's what grips the Bible, is we meditate on the Word. More Bible study? Sure, keep studying the Bible. It's great. The better we understand it, the better we can meditate. Do not let the book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day or night, that you could be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Let me end with this quick thought for us is because we go through 24 chapters, you can't forget this. This is the introduction. The rest of it is this. All these battles, all this conquering, it's like you can go back and say, well, yeah, you remember I mentioned keep the word in your mouth always, meditate day and night so that you can be prosperous. Now let's talk about Jericho. And you could talk about this. Now let's talk Rahab. Let's, talk, let's go back to meditate so that you will be able to follow through. We'll talk about the city of Ai. It goes on and on. It's all built on this text. If you had to navigate a minefield, which I have not yet in my life ever had to do, but I've got a minefield ahead of me, one option is just don't move. Just don't move. It could, be, it could be a long time, like forever, but you're, not, you're going to be fine if you don't move. You could use experience because you know people who have been in this field, and so they're like, yeah, see that little bit of a mount? That's probably a bad sign. I wouldn't step there. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah. And I've watched a war movie. I think that area is safe, and I'm using experience. I could talk to people. But if I knew the one who either planted or allowed planted, watched it, watched the whole thing made, if he's on my side, I'm going to listen to him. In fact, I'm going to block out what I'm seeing because what I see can be so distracting and misleading. I'm going to focus on the one who created it, allowed it to be created, who watched it all be put together. That's who I want to talk to. Not in a note where I'm just going to use it as, okay, he said these things. No, I want to commune with that mind and that heart. That's what... Yeah, don't let his word depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night because he knows the minefield of life that you're facing. At school, he knows the hearts of those that you're struggling with. He knows more about it. He's allowing it in your life for some reason. I don't know why he's allowing it. No idea. Why does he allow cancer for some? Why does he allow a family to split up? It makes, makes no sense to me. I'm not going to figure it out. But I do know that he knows. The Bible's referred to as a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. So my encouragement for you this week is in your Bible reading, 
slip into that time of just contemplation. You have trouble at night where you're thinking the wrong things, whether they're blatantly wrong or they're just not beneficial. Take a phrase. Take a half sentence from this passage maybe and go to bed just saying it over and over and allow his word to penetrate from your mind into your heart. Then, according to his word, we have great success. He's promised it. And we can live that way. Bow with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the privilege of reading this, explaining a real simple, beautiful truth. I'd ask that you would help us apply it into our hearts and minds this week. In Jesus' name, amen.